Buongiorno a tutti, uh, good afternoon to everybody. It may, be, may appear a little odd that um, a, web, a web seminar of uh, the Italian Association, <coughs> Antitrust Association, with uh, three Italian speakers is held in English. Uh, there are different explanations. One could be that Massimiliano didn't want to uh, didn't want to translate his uh, English uh, slides. Uh, the other one is the interest of the case and the fact of having a, a commission officer commenting on a commission decision which uh, has had a lot of publicity, is still widely discussed, and uh, it is also very controversial. Uh, it is very controversial because <clears throat> The, the, the investigation on Google Shopping went on for more than seven years. It involved parties which are not small potatoes, parties like Microsoft or like eBay, who have gathered together to sustain the, uh, the abuse of dominance by Google Shopping. And it is very controversial because there's some ideas that uh, behind this decision is not so much a concept of competition or efficiency, but a concept of fairness. At the last uh, ABA meeting in Washington, uh, Mrs. Commissioner Vestager, who participated in the round table of enforcers, and uh, she talked about Google Shopping and uh, she stressed the decision about opening the platform to uh, uh, different operators uh, and the president of the session uh, and, and then asked whether everybody agreed on this and the president of the session who is also the current chairman of ABA said that he didn't use Google he only used Amazon and the audience uh, uh, clapped so there seemed to be different opinions about uh, 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 the content, the market, and uh, the effect of competition. And therefore, it's very interesting that we hear uh, both the, the, the exposition by uh, Massimiliano Cadar, who is the deputy head of the unit telecommunication who investigated uh, Google, and I, I know he has been working on the case for many years. I'm glad Massimiliano is here with us also because I bring the pleasure working with him for a couple of years while he was here at Gianni Rigoni, then he decided to move into the public service and I'm glad he did it. And then we have uh, two very good discussions. One is uh, Marco Dostumi, is also, who will actually chair the, semi the, the, the seminar and, uh, and will give his view. Marco Dostumi is a partner of Cleary Gottlieb. Cleary Gottlieb uh, uh, in Italy. Cleary Gottlieb has been assisting Google, but Marco is not, so I think he will give us a, a, a balanced view about uh, the, the decision. And then we have Cecilia Nardini. Cecilia Nardini is, uh, Cecilia Nardini actually. She is a, 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 an economist uh, who works with the Compass Lexicon, who recently joined uh, the Italian Antitrust Association, and uh, we, we are, so we, we welcome her and, uh, and the company in this. And, uh, and she has a long experience of uh, dealing with antitrust cases. Uh, before uh, joining the private practice, she also worked at Ofcom, so she has a very good experience also from the regulator's point of view. So I think I finish with this and I will leave uh, to Marco Dostuni for further introduction and then to Massimiliano Cadare. And I'd be glad to hear to this, to hear the discussion. Uh, I'm very interested in what's going on. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Alberto. Um, we, we have discussed at some length with the, with the other participants to this webinar, uh, what kind of, 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 of presentation we're going to give. As, as Alberto said, uh, some of us are slightly involved with the case. Well, Massimiliano obviously is from the commission. I'm from Cleary Gottlieb, so from a firm that represents Google, although as, as Alberto said, I was not involved in their direct representation. And so in a sense, uh, uh, one could think that we have a slight bias in one direction or the other. And we thought we might as well play a bit the part. Uh, Cecilia, on, on the other hand, was not involved 
in in the case from from either side um, but it, in fact we were, our our main goal would not be it is not to uh, anticipate a, a litigation which is currently ongoing on the case in the appeal uh, proceedings against the commission decision it is rather to try and spot interesting controversial issues in the case now that after a few months since the original decision in june 27 of 2017 we can add some perspective now that litigation is ongoing because the parties briefs have been filed uh, one on september 11 as 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 uh, ominous as that date may be of 2017 uh, and the commission's brief the commission's reply brief on on february 8 um, and so, in light of, of an evolving discussion on this case, we will just try to be, each of us, as unbiased as we can. Uh, Massimiliano will give a very much more structured presentation. He's actually the keynote speaker, so he will highlight the, 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 the basics of the case and educate those who have not yet, uh, 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 or are not yet familiar with, with uh, the, 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 the basic parts of the case. Whereas Cecilia, and uh, uh, after Cecilia myself, will try to give a more, uh, 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 a more, well, a more critical perspective, not necessarily critical in the sense that we will try to criticize the, the commission position, but just trying to second guess uh, uh, what the court uh, might eventually uh, focus their interest on and what could be the, the, the important news for the online community and for the uh, competition law uh, community that would come uh, from this uh, from, from a judgment by, by the European Court. So with that and without further ado I will pass the floor on to uh, Massimiliano for his presentation. Let me just remind you that if you have uh, questions about what you're going to hear about the presentation or general doubts about the Google Shopping case, you can select uh, uh, the, the, the question icon on, on, the, on the menu scroll on, on your, on your um, screen and you, so you can write to us these questions and we will look at them and at the end of the presentations there will be uh, a Q&A uh, uh, time where we will all appear back again on the screen uh, and we will try to give you the answers at least to, uh, uh, I, I don't promise all of the questions that you make, it depends very much on the number, but at least on the main questions that we're able to identify. So with that, the floor is to Massimiliano, thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, one second, I'll try to put my presentation full screen. Here we are. So, uh, to start with, thank you to, uh, to Alberto, uh, to uh, Marco and to Mario Sodino for the, uh, the kind invitation. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be here today uh, to discuss the Google Shopping uh, decision. Uh, I should say, uh, perhaps uh, I respectfully disagree with Alberto. The reason why we do this uh, webinar in English is not that I didn't want to uh, translate the presentation, but it's rather to make sure uh, that a broad and uh, a varied audience could, uh, uh, could participate to this uh, event. Uh, I should also say, uh, as a disclaimer before starting, that I have not uh, personally worked on this case. Uh, although in my previous position as case handler in uh, Unit C3, uh, I have been, still at R, I still am actually working on uh, other investigations uh, related to Google, and of course I was working in the same unit uh, which dealt with uh, this case, but I was not uh, personally involved uh, in uh, this uh, investigation. Uh, so I would uh, dive uh, straight into the substance and start uh, uh, with uh, the subject matter of today's presentation, which is uh, uh, the Google Shopping decision, as uh, uh, of course you will remember, on the 27th of June uh, 2017, uh, the Commission uh, has uh, adopted a decision finding that Google uh, abused uh, its dominant position, uh, uh, therefore breaching Article 102 uh, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, uh, and the decision fined Google uh, 2.4 uh, 
billion uh, euros uh, for such breach. Uh, what is uh, uh, the conduct at stake? Uh, essentially, we're speaking about uh, Google promoting uh, its own comparison shopping service uh, to the detriment of uh, uh, rival comparison shopping services uh, in its uh, uh, the results of its organic search uh, uh, service. Uh, the, the conduct has two sides. On the one side is the, uh, the, uh, the display and the more favorable treatment of its own uh, comparison shopping service. And on the other side, uh, uh, there is a so-called demotion of uh, uh, its rival uh, comparison shopping services. Uh, and uh, a large part of this presentation will be uh, uh, dedicated to uh, discussing what does it mean and how we will implement this contact and what was the, the, the subject of the analysis uh, of the European Commission. Uh, I should say to start with uh, that uh, I find it slightly ironic that uh, for years, uh, in particular after the Intel judgment, uh, the main criticism uh, against the European Commission was uh, the Commission is adopting a formalistic uh, approach. Uh, in Intel, the Commission is relying on the case law on exclusivity rebates without looking at the facts, even if, of course, in the interface, we did look at the facts. Uh, and on the other hand, nowadays, uh, the criticism addressed uh, uh, to this decision in particular is, uh, oh, uh, the Commission has not said what kind of abuse uh, is this. Uh, so uh, now that we have a decision which is clearly based on an effects analysis, Apparently, uh, some scholars and commentators are arguing that uh, we should have put this infringement in uh, one box as opposed to another. Uh, as I said, I think there is some tension between these two lines of argument. Uh, I wanted to start by saying that, uh, at least from my point of view here, speaking in my personal capacity, uh, this is a leveraging uh, abuse, uh, and it is actually a pretty traditional uh, leveraging abuse. Uh, in essence, Google has been using its dominance in one market, which is general search, to achieve an advantage, uh, an, a new advantage, an advantage which was uh, uh, not competition on the merits in a neighboring market, which is uh, comparison shopping uh, services. Uh, and I will explain more in detail in my presentation uh, what I mean uh, by this. This is a screenshot which you might have uh, seen already. Uh, why it is helpful? Because it helps him to uh, explain what the conduct uh, at stake uh, uh, is. Uh, essentially, as I said, there are two sides of the same conduct. Uh, let's put ourselves in the shoes of a, of a user of the Google search engine uh, when, uh, let's say, I want to uh, Google uh, inkjet printers. So I go on Google page, Google inkjet printer, and what is the result of the, of the, of the query? Uh, on the one hand, I have uh, uh, the Google uh, so-called shopping unit, which comes on the top of the page and shows uh, a number of uh, inkjet printers that can be bought by third parties uh, by means of Google's own comparison shopping service. Uh, and this is uh, one side of the conduct. Uh, and I underline this is Google's comparison shopping service. Uh, the other side of the conduct is that uh, I do not see uh, among the results uh, in the first, second, uh, and normally third page uh, any competing comparison shopping service uh, because these comparison shopping services have been demoted, uh, meaning that their position has been uh, by means of algorithm, algorithms uh, removed from the first pages uh, and located positioned in the uh, on average fourth uh, page. Uh, and Google's own comparison shopping services service has not been uh, treated with the same uh, algorithm. Uh, and I will discuss more, this, uh, more on this uh, later. Uh, another point which I wanted to make at the outset, uh, this is an effect which relies uh, on a very much, uh, in, a very in-depth uh, effect uh, analysis. Uh, we have sent uh, a request for information to uh, around 800 companies, uh, which is really uh, a lot. Uh, I'm sure that people who are familiar with uh, uh, our investigation are aware of the fact that we're speaking about a huge number of companies involved. Uh, we have collected and analyzed the traffic data from uh, uh, around the 360 websites, in particular uh, competing comparison shopping services. Uh, we have looked at data on the importance of traffic generated in particular by Google uh, and on uh, the uh, commercial uh, importance of being visible 
uh, in Google search results, meaning uh, what is the effect of a website being placed on the first page or the second page and so on and so forth. What kind of impact it has on the traffic to that page. Uh, we also looked at user uh, behavior studies, uh, for example, uh, which parts of a website uh, are more visible and therefore uh, or which parts of the of a website users are more likely to click. Uh, we have looked uh, at the data on the link between traffic and visibility and perhaps something which became uh, pretty well known, uh, we have analyzed uh, around 5.2 terabytes of user query data, uh, which uh, uh, amounts to around 1.7 billion search queries. Uh, of course, this is very remarkable, uh, a significant number, uh, number of, uh, of search queries. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, as in many of our investigations, we have relied on internal documents uh, by Google. So uh, I wanted to put this up front to make clear that uh, our findings and the results of our investigation is based on a very significant body of, uh, of evidence. If we start with uh, the details of the decision, uh, of course, as in any one or two cases, uh, we started from uh, uh, market definition uh, and uh, dominance analysis. Uh, and as in, uh, any, uh, uh, as in any leveraging case, we have two markets, uh, one market in which uh, the dominant company is dominant and another market in which the dominant position is leveraged. Uh, if we start from the market in which, uh, according to the Commission, uh, Google is uh, dominant, that market is the market for general search. Uh, we have looked, uh, uh, I think it's a pretty standard uh, demand and supply side substitutability analysis, we have looked uh, as to whether uh, uh, general search websites and uh, namely the, uh, the general search service provided by Google is substitutable with uh, uh, different categories of, uh, of websites. On the one hand, the content sites, for example, uh, YouTube. On the other hand, social networks such as Facebook. And third and importantly, uh, specialized search websites. And we have concluded on the basis of a, a thorough market investigation that uh, uh, there is a, a separate demand for general search services, and I think it's pretty intuitive. Pretty intuitive. If uh, we want to know something about uh, a given uh, 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 whatever a product, for example, on which we just want to have uh, general information about the website uh, which discusses that product, then we go to Google. Uh, there is, in other words, a separate category of queries for which Google cannot be uh, replaced by other websites. We have also concluded uh, that because of a number of factors, such as, for example, language, uh, the relevant markets are uh, national in scope uh, at the, uh, the EEA level. Uh, when it comes to dominance, uh, we started, as usual, uh, by looking at market shares. We have found that uh, Google has generally uh, market shares about, uh, about 90% in each market in which uh, the conduct uh, took place. Uh, we have seen that users are unlikely to multi-home. Uh, Google has a very strong brand. Uh, of course, when, uh, uh, one, when users want to Google uh, something, uh, the very verb of Google is used, so this verb has been included in the Oxford uh, Dictionary. So uh, I think it's very difficult to deny that Google has a very uh, strong uh, brand. Uh, in addition to that, we have looked at, uh, uh, as usual, uh, bias to entry. Uh, of course, there is a very significant amount of investment which is required in order to enter uh, this market. Uh, and perhaps a point which uh, is uh, quite important, which is, which is quite specific to this case, uh, is uh, the value of data. Uh, our investigation has shown that uh, data can constitute a barrier to entry uh, in the market for search, because uh, in order to optimize uh, a search engine, it is necessary uh, to have a huge amount of data which shows if, for example, uh, the search results which are shown to users are relevant or not. Uh, and by accumulating more data, uh, Google uh, can manage to improve its search service. And for uh, competitors, it would be very difficult to match uh, the data that Google has accumulated over the years uh, and to uh, build up a product that will, co will be uh, competing uh, with the general search engine of uh, Google. Uh, finally, uh, the market exhibits uh, uh, some two-sided uh, uh, features, and that also reinforces uh, uh, the fact that there are buyers to entry uh, in the market. When it comes to the second market, so the market in which the dominant, the dominant has been leveraged to, uh, that market uh, has been defined by the Commission as uh, uh, the market for comparison shopping services. Uh, what kind of uh, products or websites we're speaking about? 
essentially we're speaking about services which allow uh, the user uh, to search for a different type of products and compare the prices and characteristics uh, across uh, the offer of several different online retailers. Uh, so we're not speaking about uh, merchant websites or merchant platforms like Amazon or eBay, but we are rather speaking about websites like who, Twenga, found them, and so on and so forth, uh, whose core business is to compare prices and uh, to redirect a user to a third website, which then would allow the user uh, to, uh, uh, take, uh, uh, to enter into a transaction uh, with, with a merchant, if, of course, the user uh, wishes uh, so. Uh, one important uh, feature is that uh, Google has not invented uh, comparison shopping services. Uh, its first comparison shopping service was called Frugal, uh, and in fact, it was not very good. Uh, we will see uh, uh, in the uh, rest of my presentation some quotes uh, which were referring to the fact that Google's uh, own employees were aware of the fact that uh, at the beginning, Google's comparison shopping service uh, was actually characterized by a quite poor performance. Uh, and that was, in the Commission views, the reason why Google had to put in place the conduct in order to boost uh, its own comparison shopping service to the detriment of uh, rivals. One argument which uh, has been uh, presented by Google quite forcefully, also in, the, also in the public domain, is that comparison shopping services would be a part of a big market which would also include merchants and uh, merchant platforms. Uh, now, starting from merchants, I think it's quite easy to conclude that this will not be the case uh, for the simple reason that merchants do not have a general comparison function. Uh, normally on the website of a merchant to buy, for example, an, a TV or a Samsung website, uh, you would only be able to search within the products that are uh, sold by that merchant. Uh, whereas instead, the, real, the very rationale of comparison shopping services is to allow a comparison across the border between different uh, merchants. Uh, as regards merchant platforms, so for example, here we're referring to uh, the Amazon uh, marketplace, so uh, only part of the Amazon website, which is open uh, to uh, different uh, uh, retailers. Uh, the Commission concluded that uh, uh, merchant platforms are not part of the same market as uh, comparison uh, shopping websites because uh, market, uh, uh, merchant platforms are rather uh, mar marketplaces where the user goes. Uh, uh, to uh, enter into a transaction with the merchant platform itself. In other words, if a user knows that wants to buy from Amazon, uh, he or she goes on the Amazon website. If a user doesn't know uh, if he or she wants to buy from Amazon or from other merchants, then that user can go to a comparison shopping service. So in a way, the function of the two groups of services is completely uh, different. Uh, and in this regard, it's quite telling that uh, uh, Google allows merchant platforms at Amazon to be included in Google Shopping uh, as merchants, but it does not allow competing comparison shopping services to be included. Uh, and from my point of view, I think that looking at uh, uh, the business model of companies is very telling. Uh, the fact that Google allows merchant platforms but not uh, other comparison shopping services uh, uh, says in itself where Google sees uh, competition. I think that uh, says a lot. As regards the abuse, uh, the abuse is defined in the uh, decision as uh, the more favorable treatment by Google in its general search results of its own comparison shopping service compared to completing the comparison shopping service. Uh, what does it mean in practice? Uh, as I said already at the beginning, uh, the conduct has two uh, uh, different uh, sides, which are in fact two sides of the same coin. Uh, on the one side, there is the, the motion of rival uh, comparison shopping services in Google's search results. Uh, what, what does it mean in practice? Uh, well, over the year, Google has uh, implemented a number of algorithms uh, which had the effect of demoting comparison shopping services. Uh, essentially, what happened was that before these algorithms were put in place, uh, comparison shopping services uh, were potentially uh, ranking uh, quite prominently among the results of Google, but after these algorithms were implemented, they were demoted to uh, the fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh page of Google. 
which of course means uh, uh, the same as being uh, virtually invisible. Uh, I don't know how many of you have, uh, when is the last time that you have gone to the fourth or fifth or sixth page of uh, Google uh, search engine, but I think it's quite telling uh, that uh, this would have, uh, would have a very significant effect on the visibility of a website and as a result of the traffic, but we'll discuss about that later. Uh, now, importantly, uh, Google's own comparison shopping service was not subject to these algorithms. Uh, so, in other words, while uh, all the comparison shopping services have been demoted, Google's own comparison shopping service was not demoted because it was just subtracted from the scope of the algorithm. Instead of being demoted, uh, Google's comparison shopping service has been uh, systematically given prominent placement uh, on the uh, Google search page. Uh, and this is where the aspect of leveraging comes from. Uh, in other words, when users would uh, search for a product on Google, uh, the outcome of the search would be to show uh, this box, which features, uh, uh, as uh, you can see in the next slide, which we've seen already, which uh, features uh, 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 pictures, uh, and it's very attractive for users to click. Uh, and uh, as a result of, of this, users have uh, uh, an incentive to click on this box. Uh, and I think that this is something which is pretty intuitive. Uh, the, the whole decision, in a way, relies on the uh, finding that visibility uh, means uh, traffic, and traffic uh, is the key for the success of any uh, website. One thing which I wanted to, to stress, and it's quite important because there's been a lot of confusion as to what uh, our decision uh, means. Uh, our decision, the Commission decision, does not say that the design of the algorithm, uh, of the search algorithm of Google, and in particular the Panda algorithm, uh, that's the name of the algorithm which demoted competing uh, search services. So our decision does not uh, question the fact that the algorithm, the algorithm as such was legal. So we're not saying that the algorithm constitutes an abuse. Uh, and equally, the decision does not question the fact that uh, the display with pictures uh, and in prominence of the uh, shopping box, the so-called shopping unit, uh, is abusive. Uh, the decision is focused on the fact that uh, Google has, at the same time, demoted rivals while systematically given prominent placement to its own comparison shopping service. And the effects of the conduct which the Commission has assessed stem from this uh, sort of joint uh, conduct. And this is very important because a lot of the arguments from Google focus on one or the other, uh, whereas instead I think it's, uh, it's key to understand that uh, the, uh, the issues raised by the Commission related to the, the joint effects of these two behaviors, which are in fact two sides of the same coin, uh, which is uh, the more favorable uh, treatment, uh, as the Commission called it. Uh, this slide, uh, I think we have already uh, gone through. Uh, one uh, point on which I've touched uh, already upon, but which I think is, uh, it's important because it, it's really the key uh, finding of the decision is that uh, uh, traffic is uh, absolutely essential for websites. Uh, why? Uh, because through traffic, I mean user traffic, so literal users uh, going on, on websites, in this case on comparison shopping services, uh, uh, through uh, traffic websites can get revenues in the first place, and they can get data, which would help them uh, to optimize uh, their websites. Uh, the Commission has looked at various uh, sources of traffic uh, and has concluded that Google is an important source of traffic for comparison shopping services, which is quite intuitive. Uh, but if you uh, go to the decision, you will see that uh, the Commission has assessed it thoroughly uh, and has looked at different sources of traffic to establish uh, how important uh, would be uh, for comparison shopping services to receive traffic uh, through uh, Google. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, what is the effect of Google conduct? On the one hand, uh, is to decrease uh, traffic to Google uh, competitors, and on the other hand, is to increase the traffic uh, to Google's uh, own comparison shopping service. Uh, the whole decision could, in fact, be summarized as I said already that there is a link between visibility uh, on Google in particular and, uh, and traffic. Uh, so this is a pretty intuitive concept, I think. Uh, uh, as I said, if you just put, uh, uh, if you just think about the last time that you went to page four, fifth, or five uh, on Google, that says uh, a lot as to how uh, uh, much traffic can a website uh, place on that page uh, achieve. Uh, however, uh, we did not stop uh, to this intuitive concept. Uh, we went uh, further and we looked at a huge amount of data to determine uh, uh, whether indeed there is a link between visibility and, uh, uh, and traffic. 
And in order to do that, I would, uh, in order to discuss it, I think it's interesting to start from this slide, uh, which uh, shows uh, on uh, uh, the, the orange line uh, the trigger rate uh, for a uh, product universal, uh, which would then become the, uh, the shopping unit. And the two slides essentially show the same, uh, but in different uh, periods of time. Uh, the uh, blue line instead shows the total clicks. Uh, and as you can see quite clearly, there is a clear correlation between the blue line and uh, the uh, uh, orange line. Uh, the intuition behind this and behind this, uh, this exercise was to look at what happened when the Google Shopping box is shown on Google's own page. And what we see is that uh, uh, the more the shopping box is shown, the more users tend to click on it. Uh, and this is a, a confirmation of the fact that visibility matters uh, when it comes to traffic. Uh, as I said, this slide essentially shows the same thing, but related to a different product, uh, to a different uh, time period. Uh, it is clear that there is a very strong correlation between total clicks on the one hand and uh, the visibility of uh, the shopping box on Google's uh, uh, search results page. This is another interesting graph which shows uh, what, so the previous graph was showing what was the effect of showing prominently uh, Google's shopping box on, uh, on its own uh, comparison shopping service. Uh, this slide instead shows uh, uh, the other side of the coin. So what was the effect of uh, uh, the demotions and in particular the, of the Panda algorithm uh, uh, that Google has introduced, uh, which led to a very significant demotion uh, of uh, comparison uh, shopping services. Uh, so this uh, data uh, is uh, uh, visibility uh, index data, which means uh, uh, what uh, is the position, what is the ranking of given websites on Google's pages. Uh, and we see each line uh, represents a competing uh, comparison shopping uh, service. And we see very clearly that there is a sudden drop in the visibility of practically all uh, comparison shopping websites, and that this visibility does not recover afterwards. So one may wonder what happened in that period. Well, that was the introduction of uh, uh, an algorithm which had the effect of demoting uh, the completing search uh, uh, comparison shopping uh, services. So uh, in a way, what is the combined effect of these demotions and of these uh, uh, significant prominence given to uh, Google's own comparison shopping service? Uh, this is uh, the results. This is a slide which concerns the, the United Kingdom it shows that at the same time in the period of the infringement, uh, while uh, the blue lines, which, is, uh, which are the, uh, uh, the competing comparison shopping services, were going down, at the same time, Google's own comparison shopping service prominently shown with rich graphic features on the uh, website of Google was going up uh, in terms of uh, user clicks. So uh, in a way, what this slide does is to put together uh, the two uh, previous uh, slides. Sorry, I hope we didn't have technical problems. Uh, what this, uh, as I said already, one of the aspects which, which we took into account uh, was, uh, I, don't, I don't know if the previous slide has been shown, but basically I'm gonna say it again in case uh, uh, something happened uh, very quickly. Uh, so these slides show the correlation between how many times the Google Shopping Box appeared on Google's uh, uh, websites. Uh, with the, the total clicks on uh, the uh, uh, comparison shopping service of Google. As you can see, the more uh, the shopping box is shown, the more users click. This slide shows uh, uh, the effect of the algorithm, uh, which uh, actually demoted the competing comparison shopping services. Uh, so the moment when the algorithm was included, we see a sudden drop uh, in the shares. Uh, well, that was the effect of the algorithm. So. Uh, once the algorithm was uh, started to work on Google's uh, uh, website, uh, that had the exact effect of demoting on page number four, five, et cetera, et cetera, completing the comparison shopping uh, services. Uh, and the combined effect of these two practices is uh, effectively shown here, which shows that uh, uh, on the blue line, competing uh, comparison shopping services shares was going down, whereas on the red line, uh, Google's own comparison shopping service click were going up in the, uh, uh, in the period of the infringement. Uh, as I was saying, market, uh, as usual, internal documents played an important uh, part in our uh, assessment. Uh, what we uh, did was to ask internal documents from Google, and 
what we see in this slide is uh, uh, some uh, uh, considerations by, by Google's own employees uh, related to an early version of its own uh, comparison shopping service. And we see very clearly that in the views of, of uh, uh, the Google's employees, uh, uh, comparison shopping service of Google was not very good. It was called Google at the time, and we see quotes uh, of uh, Google employees uh, referring to the fact that uh, uh, Google is not a really uh, a serious contender, uh, the fact that Google simply doesn't work, uh, the fact that it has a generally bad uh, reputation, uh, and uh, uh, importantly, the fact that it is unlikely to appear high in the search results. Uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, the basis for what happened afterwards, which is that Google gave to its own uh, comparison shopping service a uh, special treatment. Uh, and we can see in this slide a number of considerations which were uh, discussed by Google's own employees. Uh, we can see very clearly uh, that in the first world, Google employees said the problem is that today if we crawl, we never rank. Uh, and uh, in the uh, uh, second quarter, uh, a number of statements to the same effect, which reflected effectively the fact that uh, had Google decided to subject its own comparison shopping service to the same algorithm as all others, uh, other comparison shopping services, uh, well, in that case, uh, uh, Google's own comparison shopping service would not have appeared on the first page. Uh, so because of that, and because Google was aware of the fact that uh, prominent uh, visibility matters, uh, Google has decided to not to subject its own comparison shopping service to uh, the algorithm and rather to stay prominently on the, uh, the top page. As we can see from the last quote, uh, which I will read, the, the product shopping one box uh, should trigger at the top any time the top result is from another comparison shopping engine. Uh, and this quote is quite, it's quite uh, telling. On the basis of all these factors, we have uh, concluded that Google's uh, uh, treatment, favorable treatment of its own comparison shopping service uh, led to uh, harm to uh, competition. Uh, in other words, uh, what Google has done has been not to compete on the merits with a product that was clearly poor and that would not have run prominently, would not have managed on its own to achieve significant profit uh, on, its, uh, on Google search engine. Google has rather decided something different, which has been to treat uh, uh, more favorably its own uh, comparison shopping service to the detriment of other uh, uh, competing uh, players. Uh, as a result of this conduct, uh, Google has foreclosed competition in the 13 markets in the EA in which the conduct took place, and Google actually became market leader in these markets by a large amount in many of them. I think it's quite uh, clear, uh, and as I said, to me it's pretty intuitive that if customers do not see uh, the comparison shopping services which compete with Google, they will not click on them. Uh, but uh, that finding has been a challenge and, uh, of course, uh, has been subject to uh, uh, arguments by Google, which we have said seriously, uh, and which, on the basis of all the data we have collected, we have uh, uh, dismissed, uh, in my view, of course, convincingly, but now we have to see what, uh, what the courts would say about it. Uh, perhaps uh, a couple of additional points, in fact, uh, my last uh, two slides, uh, uh, first, on objective justification, uh, Google has submitted that its conduct will be justified objectively uh, because uh, uh, the rich uh, features which would characterize the shopping box uh, would constitute a, a product improvement. Uh, the Commission concluded that this would not be the case given that uh, comparison shopping services uh, uh, from other companies existed well before Google. In fact, they were also better as Google uh, own uh, uh, employees have acknowledged. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Google has argued that customers and consumers benefit from the display of rich graphic features on its own uh, website. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's quite important to stress that uh, the Commission has not been arguing that this is not the case. Uh, the Commission has not argued that uh, the display of rich features and features as such on Google's uh, uh, search engine page is illegal. Uh, apart from that, uh, the problem is rather that it is always Google's own comparison shopping service that is displayed prominently on Google's page, uh, while at the same time, rivals are demoted to the fourth, fifth, and so on and so forth page. Uh, just one word of the remedies before uh, I, uh, final, I close, uh, being mindful of the time. Uh, the core principle of the remedies is cease and desist, as in, uh, uh, I would say, uh, standard practice in, in our cases. Uh, 
uh, and the core principle is uh, equal treatment between Google Shopping and uh, rival comparison shopping services. Uh, it is up to Google uh, to uh, decide how to comply with this remedy. Uh, at the moment, there is a monitoring exercise ongoing uh, by the Commission, uh, and that is why uh, I will not discuss uh, further this aspect. Uh, and uh, with this, I will uh, leave the floor to Cecilia for uh, her own presentation. Thank you. Hi, can you see me? Okay, sure. Hi, thank you, Massimiliano, and thanks, Marco, and uh, to all other organizers from the from the Associazione for inviting me here. It's a, it's a great pleasure to discuss this uh, very interesting and very controversial case. Um, so, as Marco said in his introduction, what I'll try to do is to provide a an alternative perspective, uh, or you know. A, a, you know, a, a critical view, not necessarily criticizing, but providing a critical view and an alternative perspective on on the case compared to what the Commission uh, did in, in its assessment. Um, and in particular, I'll start from uh, talking about the possible frameworks that can be applied to the abuse, and this could be either a time framework or a refusal to deal framework, which is a lot more, um, you know, re requires a lot more in terms of legal thresholds to, to successfully argue. Um, so yes, we'll talk a bit. I'll talk a bit about the economic logic of uh, refusal to deal cases and the circumstances uh, in which it can be considered abusive according to the case law and uh, according to you know potentially economic principles. Um, and I'll try then to see how the Google Shopping case can fit into this refusal to deal framework and what you would have taken to the Commission to find the conduct um, abusive. Right, so um, as Massimiliano was saying, the Commission's theory of harm is that Google was leveraging its dominance in the market for search into the market for comparison shopping services, which is a separate market for which separate demand exists. Um, the Commission did not provide a specific label for this conduct, for this, you know, for this abuse, uh, which, you know, as Massimiliano said, many people have taken issues with. Um, so, from an economic perspective, this theory of harm could uh, could fit into two possible uh, two possible frameworks. Uh, one of which is time, and the other one is a refusal to deal. So, in terms of the leveraging mechanism, um, tying in in a tying case, the, the, the leveraging would be you know with Google uh, being dominant in the search market and tying Google Shopping to to Google Search. Um, and the legal test to, you know, successfully argue that this case, is, this conduct is abusive, would be according to the Commission's guidance on the application of Article 1 of 2. So it would be it would require to establish that um, the the undertaking is dominant in the tied market, um, that the tied market constitutes a separate market, and then finally the foreclosure is likely. Um, for a refusal to deal case, as I'm going to explain in more detail in a second, the leveraging mechanism would be would be different because it's essentially a vertical abuse case, a vertical foreclosure case. The legal test would be again quite different, and again I'm going to explain this later. Um, but what I wanted to emphasize is that the rationale for enforcement is quite similar between the two types of cases. So both, in both cases, the Commission, the enforcer, would be required to strike the balance, the right balance between you know, potential efficiency um, or pro-competitive aspects of the conduct, for instance, increasing the incentive to innovate, um, and the potential exclusionary impact of this conduct. The reason why framing is very important, and you know the, the reason why probably you know, so many people have taken issue with the Commission not fitting this type of conduct into a specific box, is that the legal framework between these two types of, uh, of, of abuses is quite different, and in particular, it is a lot more uh, difficult, I would say, from my um, from my perspective, to successfully argue a refusal to deal. Sorry, uh, it's a lot more difficult to argue yeah, a refusal to deal case uh, compared to a time case. So the leveraging mechanism in a refusal to deal case uh, works in the following way. So as I said, it is essentially a vertical foreclosure case where we would have a dominant undertaking in the upstream market from U1, in this case, obviously Google search, 
um, which refuses, which basically integrates its story with uh, its uh, a downstream unit, in this case Google Shopping, and uh, refuses to sell the input to uh, Google Shopping rivals, so you know, for instance, Yelko, uh, Fun, D2. Um, obviously, it doesn't have to be an outright refusal to deal. It can be uh, any other form of you know, degradation of the quality of the input or degrading, or as was the case in the Google Shopping decision, um, degrading the, the placement of uh, rival comparison shopping services. So from an, economic, from an economic perspective, as I was saying, the assessment of the refusal to, of a refusal to deal requires to balance uh, you know, the potential pro-competitive aspects i.e. the efficiencies uh, potentially arising from this conduct with the potential for the conduct to cause uh, anti-competitive effects and in particular the foreclosure of downstream rivals. So on the one hand we have you know, efficiencies that are typically, especially in this, in this case, um, are typically uh, more prominent in a dynamic sense. So efficiencies in this case would be preserving the incentive to invest because if you know, Google, uh, or, you know, if the upstream firm knew that it was forced to grant access to whatever input or whatever, you know, product innovation is developing, uh, if you knew that it was forced to grant access to this input to downstream rivals, may be discouraged from investing in the first place. Um, there can also be other, you know, static efficiencies, in this case, I guess, you know, maybe less, um, less prominent. Um, on the other hand, you know, there could be a number of anti-competitive consequences from this conduct and in particular uh, you know, reducing or eliminating competition uh, at the downstream level through you know, raising rivals' costs or reducing traffic, uh, as was the case here, reducing traffic and therefore reducing uh, you know, the visibility and, uh, and revenue to, to rival comparison shopping services. Um, this could also you know, prevent the emergence of new products uh, at the downstream level for which consumer may have uh, may have you know, demand and interest. And there could also be a more dynamic aspect to this, which I guess was unlikely in this case, but is, is, sometimes, uh, is, is sometimes raised, um, which is to protect dominance of stream basically by you know, undermining downstream rivals' ability to compete so that they don't uh, have the means and, and incentive to, to integrate upstream and climb up the ladder. Um, so, the, as I was saying, the, the, the bar, the legal bar to successfully argue and establish that a refusal to deal is abusive um, has been subject to a lot of discussion and has been uh, you know, kept, uh, raised relatively high, I would say. Um, so a, a landmark case was the Oscar Bronner case in which the European Court of Justice in 1998, it's a very old case, um, established that uh, refusal to deal is abusive if three cumulative um, conditions hold. One is that the upstream input is indispensable for downstream competition. The second condition is that the refusal uh, basically causes the, um, the upstream dominant undertaking to reserve for itself uh, the secondary market and therefore eliminates all effective competition from that market. The third condition is that the, um, uh, there is no objective justification for this conduct. So this case sets a very high bar in terms of indispensability, um, especially for you know, demanding enforcement and in particular compelling access to uh, the input provided by a dominant company um, under Article 102. These criteria were largely uh, reflected in the Commission's guidance on the application of Article 102, which has a very similar language to the article to the Oscar Bronner um, judgment. In particular, the uh, the conditions set in the guidance were that the upstream input has to be objectively necessary to compete effectively downstream. Uh, secondly, that the refusal is likely to lead, again, to the elimination of effective competition downstream, which is a word-by-word -word, um, reception of the ECJ judgment. And thirdly, that the refusal is likely to lead to consumer harm, um, which is obviously at the heart of the Commission's uh, enforcement priorities uh, for, for Article 102. Um, this framework has further evolved with subsequent case law, or in particular on the refusal to license um, intellectual property rights, 
And this case law has basically established the principle that refusal to deal is abusive in only under exceptional circumstances. And these exceptional circumstances have come to be defined uh, essentially on a case-by-case -case basis. So in, uh, in McGill, the European Court of Justice um, established that the exceptional circumstances were, first of all, that the input has to be indispensable. Secondly, that the, nom that the nominating firm, uh, you know, through the refusal was essentially reserving for itself a secondary market. And thirdly, that there was no objective justification to this conduct. So this, this judgment was essentially uh, Again, very very similar to the criteria uh, in the Oscar Bronner case that came later on. Um, in the IMS case, which was about 10 years later, the ECJ again uh, found that the exceptional circumstances held for finding of an abuse. So, and in this case, the, circ the exceptional circumstances were again very similar. So, first of all, the refusal prevented the emergence of a new product for which demand existed. Secondly, there was no objective justification. Uh, for the conduct, and thirdly, the refusal eliminated competition in the, in the secondary market. What the ECJ did in this case uh, was to say that these criteria were sufficient, but they were not necessary, and therefore it opened the door for finding, um, again, you know, the kind of case-by-case -case definition of the exceptional circumstances under which um, the a refusal to deal can be abused. And this principle was again uh, repeated in the Microsoft judgment by the General Court in 2012. In that case, the court found that essentially the IMS health principle uh, held in the Microsoft case, but it also specified that this list of circumstances was by no means limitative, so other you know, exceptional circumstances could apply in, uh, in different cases. Um, these legal principles uh, can be you know, incorporated and translated into the economic framework that I was just explaining to you uh, in the following way. So the, the, the three criteria basically mean that the anti-competitive consequences of a refusal to deal are, uh, you know, are particularly uh, severe when, first of all, the asset is indispensable, or at least it is important to compete effectively downstream. And the, I guess the degree of importance is, has to be you know, fairly specific and, and fairly uh, you know, properly uh, appreciated in the sense that there has to be no viable alternative to the input. You know, it can be uh, you know, physically viable or economically viable. Um, secondly, the conduct is likely to, to cause foreclosure in, uh, in the downstream market, so eliminate effective competition in the downstream market. Thirdly, again, the refusal uh, has to lead to consumer harm. But then, you know, following the IMS Health and the Microsoft Judgment, uh, other exceptional circumstances may actually be relevant in different cases. Um, on the other hand, the you know the pro-competitive aspects of this conduct, i.e., the efficiency justification for us to refusal to deal, would typically be strongest when the incentives to innovate ex ante are very strong, and there is a concern that an investment would not have been made had the company anticipated that it would have been forced to uh, sell or provide the inputs to downstream competitors. And obviously, enforcement uh, is, uh, is less costly than uh, non-enforcement when the anti-competitive consequences are greater or you know, more severe or more significant than the efficiencies in that case. A refusal to deal uh, would be considered abusive and enforcement would be um, justifiable. Um, so against this background, um, what I wanted to discuss is, you know, having set out the criteria for which, under which a refusal to deal would be considered anti-competitive, had the conduct, the Google conduct, be considered um, being you know, framed as a, as a refusal to deal, um, how would the commission, you know, would the commission have been able to, to pass the threshold for um, for funding and abuse? So the first criteria, as I said before, would be to establish indispensability. Um, as Massimiliano said, the commission found that, uh, that the traffic generated through Google search is very important for comparison shopping services to compete effectively. Um, I'm not sure that this actually amounts to a definition of, it, of indispensability, um, from, from you know, in, in, in my view. Um, 
and quite importantly, I think that this question of accessibility is uh, a function of basically how the market is defined. So if the market is defined in a, in a narrow way, and uh, as Massimiliano you know, outlined, the Commission did define the, the downstream or the, the, the comparison shopping service market in a, in a relatively narrow way, um, indispensability may be more uh, what well, Google search, the traffic generated through Google search might be defined uh, as, a, as a potentially indispensable. But had the market been defined uh, more broadly, potentially the same conclusion would not have uh, been applicable. And quite interestingly, I think the case uh, essentially revolves around two different views of how consumers do their shopping online. Um, so, you know, according to the Commission, basically, if I need a pair of sunglasses, uh, what I would do is I would first search for products through uh, Google search, um, and then I would compare the various products, the various options using a comparison site, and then through that I would click on a merchant website. Um, Google's view is different, and, uh, you know, Google is arguing potentially, you know, more in line with certainly my experience and I think the experience of uh, various people. Um, Google is arguing that the shopping, the online shopping experience is far less, you know, structured and you know, more organic in a way. Um, so I can you know, reach the, the sunglasses I want to buy, not just, you know, through Google search and then comparison shopping websites, but also, you know, via specialist search, via potential Amazon or other merchant platforms, or through clicking on ads, social networks, and so on. Um, and it is, to be honest, it is quite difficult to uh, to determine which of the two views is, is correct, particularly because of, you know, two, two, two aspects. One is that the decision spans a number of years, uh, and during this period, online shopping and in general, you know, digital platforms have grown and improved exponentially. So consumer habits have changed and you know this, this growth has certainly influenced consumer habits. And in my opinion, consumer habits have evolved towards a much less you know rigid or structured um, consumption or experience of online shopping services. Therefore, you know, potentially more in line with Google's view rather than uh, the Commission's view. On the other hand, uh, preferences and habits uh, with respect to online shopping may vary across consumers and may vary across countries. So the Commission applied that decision basically to all of the countries in which Google Shopping is, uh, is present. And that, um, you know, habits and preferences across countries may vary because there are some more sophisticated customers uh, which are likely to uh, have this kind of more organic and less structured experience of online shopping and, you know, compare multiple sources rather than just you know, start from Google search, um, whereas other consumers may have a more uh, structured uh, process for, for searching and for shopping online. And I'm not sure from the Commission's analysis that, you know, that their survey and their analysis were able to capture all these, all these differences. Um, the second criteria for establishing an abusive refusal to deal was um, uh, that it was likely to, call, to cause foreclosure. Um, as Ms. Emiliano said, the, com the Commission found that uh, the reduction in traffic following the change in Google's algorithm was capable to drive uh, rival, consuming, uh, rival comparison shopping services um, out of the market by reducing their traffic uh, significantly. The data indeed does show that there was a generalized decline in traffic for comparison shopping sites, although there were a few exceptions. But again, this is a, uh, you know, the, these findings, in my opinion, follow directly from uh, the definition of market, the definition of the relevant market. Um, because, you know, had the market been defined in a different way, obviously the relevant evidence would have been, would have been different. Um, and therefore the Commission might have reached a different conclusion. Um, which begs the question of whether, you know, the Commission is seeking to protect competition or rather is seeking to protect competitors, which is a criticism that has been levied against the Commission's decision because, you know, most of us have never heard of these very small shopping services. I've never used them potentially. And, uh, you know, so is, is the Commission trying to, to, to protect uh, basically their, their survival or is, is the Commission seeking to protect uh, competition? which is obviously related to the impact of the conduct on consumers and whether it had any harm. 
So the Commission again found that um, Google's conduct was likely to, to generate harm in terms of, on one hand, higher fees for merchants, higher prices for consumers, and less innovation, and on the other hand, on the ability to consumers to access uh, the most relevant comparison shopping services. In my view, in you know, uh, a few years after the, this kind of alleged conduct, uh, abusive conduct started. Is it true that consumers have less choice? In my view, consumers now do have more choice than before. Um, and, you know, as I was saying before, consumers have likely become more sophisticated, their, um, their, their habits have evolved, and now consumers shop through multiple platforms. So it is not clear that there is a causal link between the um, the conduct and uh, or the, that the conduct has had a reduction on the choice the consumer has. Um, on the other hand, uh, so in terms of efficiency justification and impact on incentives to invest and innovate, um, you know it is not clear to me that there is a strong case for uh, efficiency or for an efficiency defense here. So. Uh, Google, you know, is there any reason why Google Shopping should be uh, constantly uh, given a prominent position? Does it perform better as a top result than rival comparison shopping websites? Um, this is not clear. Um, and Google uh, was arguing in, in their defense that they have provided uh, online shoppers with an improved service over time. Um, this, again, you know, is not necessarily uh, apparent, at least not throughout the whole period of infringement because you know, it, it may have been the case since the introduction of the, you know, the, the shopping unit in 2013, but not necessarily with the change of the Panda algorithm in 2011. Uh, and then quite importantly, you know, the exempty incentives to invest. I mean, where are these incentives? The, the Google's investment in, uh, to invest in, uh, in comparison shopping services is actually quite small compared to the investment in Google search. And quite importantly, these investments are not conditional on the success of Google Shopping. So it is also difficult, in my opinion, to argue that um, you know, the, a, a, an infringement finding and the finding of abuse would undermine Google's incentive to innovate in Google Shopping example, because these incentives are very, these investments are small in the first place and, um, and they are concentrated on, on another product. Um, with this, I, I conclude. Uh, I hope I give you some. I hope I've given you some uh, uh, perspective on on the critical aspects of the case and the controversial aspects of the case. And I leave the floor to uh, Marco Dostuni. Thank you. There I am. So, uh, thank you, Cecilia, for your for your very interesting thank you Cecilia for your very interesting uh, uh, presentation um, you gave a, a few critical comments on the Commission's perspective and uh, I'm afraid I will try uh, to do the same uh, by focusing on a few controversial issues that are that that surround the decision uh, I am sure that my colleagues uh, representing Google could be uh, could object to the fact that I'm selecting these points and not others uh, because of course there are very many uh, points of facts points of fact and of law that are discussed uh, uh, before the court however I think this in are, are, are a good simplified way of, of showing why uh, uh, the Commission's case which was very well presented by Massimiliano in reality has a few shadows apart from the ones a few more shadows in addition to the ones that, that Cecilia already is shown. So first of all, I will focus on the importance of market definition in this case. You might have heard uh, that, that Google's uh, case is argued uh, uh, also through a, a slogan that's repeated. Google uh, um, defended itself before the commission by saying that after all, in this case, competition is just one click away uh, it's it's uh, it's been heard many times now, but what does it mean in practice uh, when we're coming to product market definition? Well, the best way that, that I can understand this is by uh, making a comparison between uh, advertising and, and content on traditional media, uh, uh, 
like uh, television, which is also a two-sided market, and, and uh, the uh, internet environment in particular. And uh, one must notice that in an online environment, the distinction between content, advertising, and commercial transactions is blurred by nature. What does that mean? Well, if we were watching the old traditional television, uh, we, we would know uh, uh, immediately uh, what is content uh, uh, that's broadcast and what is advertising. And when we see advertising, when we see a spot, it's clearly marked. And uh, there's no way normally to interact with the advertising. Even if you like the product, it's not like you can buy it through the screen of a TV. But online, all of these barriers are blurred. First of all, it is, there's less regulation on advertising, uh, for instance, less regulation on advertising limits. And uh, so advertising can be in very many forms and can not always be spotted as such. Also, uh, on the video that shows content, there can be uh, a mix up of advertising and content because of the millions of different ways that graphically uh, internet can present and, uh, and content. And of course, internet is interactive. So when you see advertising on the internet, you can click on it and you can purchase what you're seeing almost immediately. Normally, uh, if you click on advertising, you get transported to a website, which is for instance, a merchant's website or a merchant platform where you can perform the transaction. So uh, uh, it is very difficult to say when the advertising finishes and the shopping starts, or also when the content finishes and the advertising starts. Um, another feature of the internet and, and this one click away concept is that it's much more difficult now to uh, 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 abuse with the traditional tying or bundling uh, uh, as it were in the old days. Uh, think of Microsoft. In, micro, in Microsoft, there was in Microsoft there was tying of Microsoft Web Explorer with the operating system. And why was that tying? Because at the time, uh, it was more difficult for users to get rid of, of Microsoft's media player from the operating system and uh, download another one. Uh, it was technically more difficult. But now on the internet, if you want to change the parameters of, of the way you navigate, if you want to change uh, uh, the, the, the kind of navigator you're using, if you want to uh, 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 use an app instead of another, it's all very easy to do. If you want to switch to another website from the one you're seeing or you want to switch to another content, it's all very easy. So uh, tying or bundling in this case, in, in Google's case, it's, it's, it's kind of a, of a difficult theory of abuse to make because it's very clear that users are not tied to using a uh, Google's product. Um, another feature of the of the online environment is that there is an enhanced complementarity of different kind of contents and different kind of services that you find online. I make a general example. If you are looking for information or entertainment, you can go on online newspapers or you can search videos on YouTube or Vimeo's or other video providers, or you can go to a social network and look for news there, uh, or you can use search facilities on different websites, including, uh, but not only social networks, also merchant platforms and all. So in a sense, someone who wants information can get it from many different services, which in a way could be pigeonholed into different relevant markets. And the same goes for uh, price comparison. Because after all, as, as Cecilia was saying, if someone is looking on the internet for a product, so runs a product search, it can get information on prices both from uh, comparison shopping services or from, from merchant platforms. It's, it's, it's very easy for someone to go to Amazon or to eBay and see uh, uh, you know what the price of, of, of the product is looking for is like uh, and then go to price comparison services it can uh, uh, google up 
uh, price comp specific price comparison services if, if it trusts them and then go on their websites and perform another search there. So it can get information on prices, stock availability, uh, retailers, merchants, pretty much everywhere on the internet. Now, having said that, uh, what is one of the problems that Google has with the 2.5 uh, 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 billion fine it's received? Well, Google very much thinks of the Google Shopping units as advertising. If you see, if you look at the screen, you will see that shopping units appear in ad space. They are marked as sponsored. And if you click on them, uh, uh, the advertising will lead you to uh, uh, the website of, of third party uh, uh, advertisers uh, that, are, that are merchants or merchant platforms or also comparison shopping services which allow uh, actual uh, purchase and there you can buy the product. So this is, these are ads to Google and that's the reason why Google treats them as uh, something different from free results of organic search. Also, this does not mean that Google runs uh, uh, um, uh, these kind of advertising anyway whenever someone runs a product search. Uh, to the contrary, Google claims uh, that when there is a product search, uh, uh, Google's algorithms uh, uh, carry out all sorts of comparisons. First of all, they uh, uh, rank and, and, and index the uh, advertisings that must uh, be presented, but they also compare uh, the quality of the advertisings that would appear in the shopping units versus the quality of the, the, the links that would appear in the generic search results. And these algorithms make sure that only if uh, the shopping units contents are more relevant to the product query than the generic search results, then the shopping unit will deserve the, 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 the advertising uh, placement uh, prominently on Google search page. So to say it otherwise, to Google, shopping units are ads and ads, as, as is quite well known to people who dealt with the case, are simply the revenue generating side of generic search. They are the way that generic search services are monetized. To the Commission, it's quite the contrary. As we have seen, uh, the Commission takes issue with, with uh, uh, Google's statement, with Google's claim that shopping units are advertising. The Commission defines different sorts of uh, relevant markets and, the commission, and to the Commission, shopping units and price comparison websites, which are uh, for Google all part of the uh, uh, comparison shopping services markets, are a specialized search market of its own, and they are a different market from generic search. They are also a different market from online search advertising and a different market from merchant platforms. Now, we can agree or disagree with the pigeonholes in which the commission puts all of this relevant market. But in the commission's decision, as you will be able to read by yourself, uh, it's quite long, but it's very entertaining you will find that the Commission almost invariably concedes that there are substantial overlaps or limited overlaps or at least complementarity between these various services. And this means what I was saying before, even though price comparison websites, generic search, online search advertising and merchant platforms are in different markets, a user who wants to purchase Nike trainers can go to all of these different markets, let's call them that way, to find the information it's looking for. And to make a whole informed decision, a sophisticated buyer will probably go on all of these markets and then some. So in line of this and of the different view of the market of the commission and Google, one could raise a few questions to put in doubt the commission's findings. First of all, what should happen then when there is a product search? It's clear that product search can be done on generic search services because we all can look to generic search service to Google 
uh, when we, we all use Google when we are looking for, uh, uh, um, when we want to know information about the product. Um, then we run a product search. This product search is, in a sense, part of the generic search because the task of a generic search is to give us the information, the information we're looking for, whatever information it is. So if I run a product search, it's clear that I'm looking for prices, I'm looking for uh, items, stock availability, uh, 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 retailers that can, online retailers that can sell me those products. So a generic search should give me this information and not just uh, I don't know, information about the history of night trainers or philosophical uh, boundaries of night trainers and so on. So it's clear that if generic search did not provide a user with product searches results, the user might start using generic search less and less. So in a sense, generic search must answer product searches. But uh, if it does that, then is it committing an abuse well, the answer to the commission would be probably not. It depends on the way the generic search answers these product searches. Then the next question, must generic search provide worse quality answers than computer, than, than comparison shopping services to preserve the market boundaries? In other words, not to commit an abuse, should Google only provide blue links, generic search results as a kind of answer whenever a user runs a product search on its Google website? Even there, the answer from the commission is no. Again, it, it must only treat all competing or comparison service shops in the same way. Uh, uh, this means if Google uh, uh, only provides its own CSS results within the blue links of the generic search results, then you can do the same with competing services. But then there's another question. What if Google decides to provide ads, as it has done with, this, with the shopping units, that uh, give price comparisons? Can Google consider this as, as sort of an improved form of advertising, uh, 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 where it, the, the, the most prominent, the most prominent uh, display of the advertising justifies, for instance, a, 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 a more a, a higher price to interested advertisers, or uh, uh, Google can only run this kind of advertising if it agrees to run the same kind of advertising for a competing comparison um, shopping services. Uh, again, the commission answer is, Google can do whatever it wants, but if, the, if it wants to uh, place the shopping unit prominently on that page, it must be sure that similar services from competitors uh, can do the same. Another question uh, is, another important question then becomes, but what about merchant platforms? Are merchant platforms also answering product searches or not? If a user goes on Amazon and eBay looking for the price and availability of night trainers, will it find the information it's looking for? The answer is clearly yes. But then, if the answer is yes, why this should me why merchant platforms are not considered an important con constraint, uh, uh, an important competing constraint on Google services? If a user can find the same kind of information on Google's generic search and on Google's shopping units and on Amazon's merchant platforms or eBay, then it is clear that there is a competitive constraint for Google. If Google wants to run an efficient generic search, it must answer product searches and it must do so in a way that will still lead the user to prefer Google's generic search to Amazon or eBay or at least to include also Google's generic search on its, on its research, uh, uh, along with searches on Amazon and eBay. So the point in the end is, if all these services, regardless of the, the kind of relevant market in which you put them, are, are actually 
substitutable, at least to a certain degree, or they are complementary. Isn't this something that should be considered when, uh, when looking at whether Google is actually distorting competition in this market? Should the Commission also look at Amazon and eBay as competitors of Google, or, or is it entitled only to focus on effects on the conduct on uh, uh, comparison shopping services? In this case, it is very, this question is very important because the online and high-tech markets are subject to what is called disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation is a kind of competition that makes market definition less important. One example is thinking about personal computers. They are clearly not in the same market as typewriters, but once personal computers were established on the market, typewriters simply became irrelevant because personal computers could perform all of the functions of the typewriters and more. So in this case, by looking at the competitive constraint from Amazon, one could say, that the fact that Amazon also allows to buy the product and not only to compare prices is an additional feature that places Amazon better than Google. And regardless of market definition, this is something that should be counted when assessing a uh, possible anti-competitive effect of a conduct. Another question that's uh, 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 quite doubtful in this case or to look at is causation. What Google has tried to show to the Commission and will try to show in court is that the shopping units did not actually have an impact on traffic on comparison shopping services. To do so, Google compared the traffic in count, the traffic to uh, aggregators, as they are called, from uh, 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 countries in which Google has introduced shopping units to countries in which shopping use, units were not introduced. And by comparing this, this, all of these countries, you can see the blue line in this, in this graphics, in these graphs are countries with shopping units. The orange line are countries without shopping units. You will see that in fact, the traffic that goes to aggregators uh, follows more or less the same lines. Now the commission says that this is not relevant because the, the trend of these lines that you see is actually the effect of Google's algorithms that demote traffic to aggregators, to competing aggregators. But on the other hand, these are also countries where the abusive conduct did not take place because uh, uh, the, those are countries in which there, one could not say that Google was at the same time showing shopping units and demoting uh, 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 other competing services. So these are still very interesting because they show that there was something on the market which clearly was not depending on the entire abusive conduct. Again, about causation, Google is trying then to show that there is a correlation between the market performance of, of comparison shopping services and the market performance on merchant platforms based on the complementarity or, or limited substitutability or in any event substitutability relation that I was talking about before. As you will see in this graph, there is a clear correlation between the higher performance of Amazon and eBay in, 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 the, in the higher part of the graphs and the, uh, uh, worst, can, the worst performance of aggregators in, in the lower part of the, of the graph which is very much accentuated in the, in the final part of the graph. This means that competition from merchant platforms, particularly as Cecilia was saying over the last years, was clearly doing something to the performance of aggregators, which is not imputable to Google's conduct. This is another graph that shows more or less the same in the UK. You will see that the performance of aggregators worsen uh, uh, with the uh, uh, marked improvement of Amazon's performance. Now, having highlighted these problems with causation, you can see why there can be doubts also about the effects on competition of Google's conduct. Um, the problem with the Commission's decision is that it focuses 
mainly, if not only, on traffic from Google's generic search to aggregators. The graphs that Massimiliano showed to you only concern the traffic that was generated from product queries on Google search websites. But in reality, uh, as you will see, there are a few, uh, there are a few indicia that uh, kind of could lead to different conclusions. First of all, over all these years, despite the abuse, aggregators, that is competing comparison shopping services, have continued to operate, and some of them are still lively and well. Another, another point is that uh, aggregators receive traffic from different sources. They do not only receive traffic from Google search. So in order to, to, to see how they are doing on the market and whether they can still fiercely compete on the market despite the allegedly abusive conduct, one should look at the, at the whole of the traffic that comparison shopping services receive and not just at the traffic they receive from, from, from Google search. Among the other sources of traffic, there are other search engines, there are mobile apps, social media, and traffic generated from online and offline advertising. That is traffic, for instance, that generated from merchant uh, websites uh, that have a contract with these competing aggregators. So according to Google, but I have to, to say that the commission does not agree with the uh, uh, methodology for measurement, uh, the situation is quite different from what uh, appeared from, from Massimiliano's presentation. Actually, uh, uh, according to Google, the, the blue part of the graph in, in the lower part of my slides is the traffic that uh, aggregators were received from other sources, whereas only the yellow part is the part of, of traffic coming from shopping units. And so whatever effect the abuse has on the business of aggregators, uh, this effect should be confined only to the yellow part. As you will see, this will put very much into question uh, uh, the uh, uh, ability of the uh, contested conduct to create uh, 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 disruptive effects on competition. Of course, there can be different ways of measuring the total traffic that aggregators receive and of measuring the relevant part for assessing the effect of abuse. But even if one agrees to different methodologies, of course, the relevant part of the aggregator's business that's impacted by the, the, the abuse will never be uh, 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 um, the, 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 the total of this traffic. Even if the uh, uh, potentially, the traffic potentially interested by the abuse were only uh, a third for instance, of, of total traffic, then one could still question that the, uh, um, that the conduct is capable of having uh, bad effects on competition. The last uh, point that, that gives pause in the Commission's decision is the legal test of abuse. Of course, you've heard Cecilia on how she was highlighting that to apply a refusal to supply test, uh, there must be an essential uh, indispensable inputs and that this is not the case. And you've heard from me that in this case, uh, uh, that this cannot be a typical case of leverage with tying because tying uh, uh, is really not possible in this case because uh, to, to say it simply, competition is what click away. So then what what is the legal test of abuse? Um, I am not going to uh, explain the issue in all of its possible complications. I just wanted to follow a simple reasoning uh, along the line of refusal to supply. We all know that Bronner sets a very high bar for refusal to supply, so you need an indispensable input for there to be uh, a refusal to supply. And uh, if uh, the supply of this input is refused, then competition would be eliminated. We also know that this very high bar has been watered down somehow along the line by Telia Sonera in, concern, in, concern, in connection with margin squeeze cases. Because Telia Sonera said, uh, in order for there to be a margin squeeze, it's not important that the input that's concerned that the subject of the margin squeeze is indispensable. A margin squeeze can occur even if the input is just important for the business of 
uh, uh, competitors that compete with the business of the dominant company downstream. Along this case, along this, 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 this line of cases, Slovak Telecom, a commission decision of 2014, applied Telesonera, the Telesonera doctrine, even to constructive refusal to supply. So it, it further watered down the Bronner legal test. And in Slovak Telecom, the commission said, it's even for constructive refusal to supply, it's not necessary for the input to be essential, as long as the input is important. But in all of these cases, so even for, for an input that's just important, but that could be substituted, even though at less advantageous conditions uh, by, by competitors, if the dominant company refused to supply it, the important thing is that there must be a supply relationship with, between the dominant company and customers or competitors in the downstream market where the dominant firm also operates. Because in all of these cases, the, the, the important thing is not only that the input was important, but that competitors, customers were already buying that input from the dominant firm. And so if the dominant firm ceased to apply, uh, the, the business of the dominant com of, the, of the customers would be disrupted and maybe disrupted in a way that would create serious problem for them to, to compete with the dominant company. However, in Google, com in Google Shopping, we, don't we clearly don't have this pattern because comparison shopping services benefit from a free byproduct of the generic search services. What do I mean by this? When a user runs a product search on generic search services, generic search services which are committed to giving a truthful answer of what is there on the web to the user, of course will mention comparison shopping services. And so some traffic will be generated that will go from the generic search to competing aggregators. That's clear, but this is just a byproduct of generic search. If generic search must be truthful, it must generate this byproduct. If, however, the provider of a generic search service wanted to run improved ads in response to product search in order to monetize more on the generic search. And by the way, Google claims that revenues from the shopping units go to Google's generic search services, not to the comparison shopping service. And this could be important. Can we say that the dominant company that provides generic search services is entitled to uh, make more money by simply reducing the spillover benefits for competing aggregators. If a generic search service were to channel users to its own ads and reduce the spillover benefits, can we say that aggregators are entitled to the spillover benefits? Can that be an abuse? Now, if you look at an apparently solid case of the commission, uh, uh, could seem to wither. And I leave you with an open question then. If favoring were an abuse, is this something that's compatible with current business models used on the internet? Think about Apple. Apple uses a wall garden model, like many big internet-based companies, whereas if you purchase an iPad, you will also have fa more favorable access to, the, to Apple's App Store, and there are only certain features that you can use on the iPad, which belong to different markets, which are only provided by Apple. Now, I'm not saying Apple is dominant in, in any market, but uh, this is a business model that's typical of the internet. And there are many other companies that operated that way. If favoring by a dominant company were to be an abuse, this could certainly create a lot of issues with many of the companies that are operating out there, particularly when they reach the size where they risk uh, 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 being found dominant. So um, I'm done.
thank you very much for your attention. And I think that if we have questions now, or if the other speakers uh, wanna wanna raise some questions on each other on one on one another's presentations, then it's time for all of us to go back on the screen and uh, have a short uh, ten minutes discussion about this, or to answer any queries from the audience. Just the time to, to technical services to put everyone else back up. And then we'll start. Okay. Hello. Can you see me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, may I react to uh, a couple of points from Cecilia and uh, uh, for Mark as well? Not only you may, but uh, you're welcome to it. Excellent. Perfect. So, of course, I will not go through uh, all the points that uh, you both have raised. Otherwise, I'm afraid we'll have to stay here until 10 p.m. Uh, and it's a Friday evening. Uh, I will start with uh, Cecilia. And I would like to, uh, to say, actually, that I found uh, her presentation very interesting and very balanced. Uh, of course, I mean, I will just repeat the, the obvious, which is that the Commission didn't do uh, a refusal to supply case uh, and uh, didn't imply that this is a refusal to supply case. A uh, refusal to supply is characterized by passive behavior, which is precisely to deny access, whereas here in this case, uh, there were several times the behavior which were, which were active, actually. The fact that Google uh, showed prominently it, uh, the shopping unit uh, uh, on the search page was an active behavior and the fact that they actively uh, decided uh, to not to subject uh, its own uh, uh, shopping uh, uh, compar comparison shopping service to the algorithm, in particular to Panda, is also a decision which is active. So I I'm not really sure that uh, the refusal to supply scheme is something which can be applied to this case, but of course it is something that Google has argued and, uh, and that then is continuing to argue before the court. So uh, I uh, think it's better to leave the words, the final words to the court and see what uh, the court will say on on this. Uh, just two short points uh, on the, uh, your point about consumers have more choice than before. Uh, of course, consumers might have become more tech savvy uh, during the uh, the period of the abuse. That that is something that I don't think that uh, anybody denies. On the other hand, uh, it's important to understand what is the counterfactual. So the counterfactual is not uh, what. Uh, uh, or would happen if the consumers were more or less tech savvy, but what would happen in the absence of the conduct? Uh, and so uh, I'm not sure that uh, is the right uh, question uh, to ask. The right question would be what happens uh, because of the conduct will have happen absent the conduct, uh, I believe. Uh, another small point, you refer to the fact that these comparison shopping services, who are they? They are just small players, they disappeared. Uh, nobody uses them. Uh, I think it's quite telling in this regard to have a look at the quotes from Google's own employees uh, when they were referring to the fact that Frugal, uh, so the first comparison shopping of Google, uh, was in fact uh, not as good as these uh, unknown players. Uh, and the fact that Google itself decided uh, to uh, develop uh, a business model based exactly on the same principles, uh, so on comparison shopping, and that this business has thrived uh, also, uh, as, as we know, during the period of, the, of infringement, shows that uh, uh, comparison shopping as such uh, is not necessarily uh, a business model which is destined uh, to fail, uh, quite the opposite, uh, I would argue. Uh, I would switch to Marco's presentation, uh, which uh, I'm afraid I cannot say the same things in terms of a balanced presentation. Uh, and Marco has confessed that he has recycled the slide used by uh, his colleagues who have been defending Google, so of course one would not expect a balanced presentation, uh, and I don't think that my job is uh, to uh, uh, stay here to reply on each and every single point because uh, many of the points have been addressed already in the decision. In the decision. That being said, uh, I wanted to make a couple of, uh, of points. I want to start with a general point. Uh, we hear a lot at conferences, uh, uh, some representatives of, uh, uh, of Google, but not only also economists and uh, representatives of other companies arguing that uh, in internet markets, uh, users switch, that competition is only one click away, and so on and so forth. Uh, 
uh, I think that that is the background of why the Commission has investigated uh, Google's conduct very thoroughly and why uh, there is a, a 240 pages uh, decision uh, and uh, why the uh, Commission team went to uh, 5.4 uh, terabytes of data and so on and so forth. So I think it's quite easy uh, to uh, say simply, oh yes, use a switch uh, without looking at the data. Uh, when you look at the data, and that is what we look at the data, uh, the numbers say something uh, different. The numbers say that uh, placement matters and that uh, there is an impact on uh, the market position of other players. And this is what we have shown in the uh, decision. Uh, second point, the general point, again, uh, there is this uh, myth, I believe, that in digital markets uh, everything is easier because markets are connected and so that increases switching. I think that actually it works also the other way around. Uh, precisely the fact that markets are connected that makes it possible for digital companies uh, to tie and to leverage their conduct from one market uh, to another. Uh, and this is something that uh, uh, should also be uh, considered in my view. Uh, the fact that this conduct took place in a digital market uh, and that we have shown, I believe convincingly that there were facts, uh, shows precisely that uh, uh, competition authorities should, in my view, keep their eyes open uh, when it comes to uh, conduct uh, uh, through which dominance is leveraged from one market to another, uh, which is a, a neighboring uh, market. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the Amazon, eBay uh, uh, the question, uh, uh, yes, uh, of course, uh, uh, those graphs that you presented were included in uh, Google's response uh, to the statement of objections, so again, it's not surprising that uh, that uh, you are taking the same position as Google. Uh, that being said, I also do not find surprising that Amazon and eBay's positions uh, have uh, thrived during the period of the infringement. And why? Uh, simply because uh, Amazon and uh, eBay were not affected by the infringement. Uh, Amazon and eBay were not demoted. Amazon and eBay were included in the shopping box. They were not seen as competitors by Google, quite the opposite. They were among the most important customers of Google. And uh, as I said already before, I think that uh, the market practice uh, of a dominant company to establish abuse is something which is very relevant. Uh, Google was demoting the competing comparison shopping services, but was not demoting Amazon, was not demoting eBay. Quite the opposite, they were uh, hosting them in the shopping box. So I do not find it surprising at all uh, that these companies might have thrived uh, in the period of the infringement. Uh, on advertising, I think it's, it's a relatively sterile discussion, frankly. I, I, I'm not sure that it matters whether we consider the shopping box as advertising or not. Uh, what matters is that it is a feature which is competing with comparison shopping services. It is something that Google itself uh, noted in its own uh, internal documents. Uh, I don't think we can consider it ads or not. Uh, what the Commission insists on is that it is not comparable to AdWords. Uh, because of a number of reasons, including the fact that uh, the uh, payment system is different, that the companies which are admitted to it are different, uh, that the, uh, the websites to which the, uh, the link directs is different, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, but I don't think that we should start to discuss whether it's advertising or not. Uh, the important point is that uh, uh, the uh, shopping box and the comparison shopping service of Google is competing with the other comparison shopping services, which were demoted and which were affected by Google's conduct, unlike uh, uh, Google's own comparison shopping uh, service. Uh, on the algorithms, uh, I sense that what you implied is that the algorithm's role is that is to increase uh, the quality of the results. I have no doubt that on, all, on average uh, this is the case. However, uh, then one wonders why Google has, uh, 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 has decided not to subject its own comparison shopping service uh, to the algorithm. Uh, if the algorithm would be there to increase the quality, then overall all uh, situations which are equal should be treated uh, equally. Uh, and I do think that this is something which Google has uh, contested, the fact that it has decided not to apply uh, the fund algorithm uh, to its own comparison shopping uh, service. Uh, last point on the graphs. Uh, on the graph that you have shown at slide Six, the three graphs which come from, I believe, Google's response to the uh, statement of rejection. Uh, those graphs, uh, I mean, I could uh, debate, I'm not an economist, so I don't think I'm best placed to, uh, uh, to debate as to whether uh, this difference in different exercises has been carried out properly or not. Uh, I will only refer to uh, paragraphs 519 and following of the decision in which 
uh, the Commission dismisses uh, that graph uh, for also uh, 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 the point of view of, uh, of the, uh, the method a methodology which was not correct, uh, but also from the, uh, the very uh, simple perspective, which is the fact that the graph only looked at the fact of the shopping unit, uh, but didn't look at the fact of the uh, of the, uh, the algorithms. Uh, but in any event, uh, paragraph 519 and following of the decision uh, contain uh, enough uh, information to uh, dismiss the uh, validity of that graph. Uh, as regards the graph at page 9, uh, as you said, the Commission contests that graph, and indeed, uh, quite uh, easy, just looking at the number of websites that you put in, is Amazon is among those which, as we say, has not been affected by the conduct which the Commission doesn't consider a comparison shopping service. In any event, paragraph 540 and following the decision contain an, an assessment of those points, uh, which from the Commission point of view uh, are far more relevant uh, than uh, the graph, which, as I said, is not uh, considered uh, robust uh, from our point of view. Uh, that being said, and I think it just it, it has to be uh, said here because uh, I think that there is a, an underlying uh, misunderstanding. Uh, there is uh, an assessment of the effect of the conduct in the decision, also under the assumption uh, uh, which Amazon and eBay and other uh, merchant platforms are part of the market, and even under that scenario, the Commission concludes that there is an effect uh, from the conduct. Uh, it is something that maybe after. Uh, almost two hours of webinars, <laughs> we, should, <laughs> we should have said. <laughs> and that's, that's it from my side for, for the time being. Okay. If I may, if I may just quickly react to, to one of your comments, um, and I guess it's, a, it's also a more general point. You said that it's important to establish what the right counterfactual is, and in your view, the counterfactual is, you know, a situation in which the, obviously the abuse wouldn't have happened, but also potentially consumers would not have evolved in the way that they have evolved in in in, uh, in light of the kind of evolution of online shopping services. I guess what I'm what I find troubling about this is that I am not sure uh, what the right counterfactual would be, and I'm not sure. Um, therefore, it, it can be really established that there is a causal link between the abuse and the the outcome, you know, in the in the counterfactual. Because in a way, you know, consumers like the the the, the, the effects that we've uh, that the commission has established are uh, a consequence of the abuse, could be equally a consequence of something else, could be actually a consequence of market evolution, could be a consequence of the way consumers' preferences have changed. So I think what I find quite troubling about the Commission's assessment of effect, and I'm not, I'm not saying it was right or wrong, it's just you know a point for uh, a kind of more general comment, um, is uh, that it is not clear to me that there is a causal link between the conduct and the effect that was served in the market. Um, so that's uh, that is my view. Well. I guess then I can uh, just just conclude the webinar that's going on for for quite some some time. Uh, but I hope it's been enjoyed by by people listening. I sure I certainly enjoy it. Um, I just um, uh, as a concluding remark, I I just want to put in line um, uh, in particular the the, the 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 arguments that I made in my slide. I. It, I try to um, uh, focus more on Google's arguments because I think that's where uh, the courts, of course, will have to uh, uh, look at the issue. And that's where um, possibly the case law on, on, on Article 102 will advance. Uh, so I am, I am very, very grateful to, uh, to Massimiliano for uh, Refining by putting the Commission's case and framing it by framing the Commission's case as a sort of reply to this argument because it makes it all the more interesting. One thing which I think is striking about this debate that it's maybe uh, a side effect of uh, uh, the case dragging on forever and parties taking becoming more and more assertive with it is that uh, um, let's say the, the Google's the Google side. Uh, will think thinks that if the court were to um, support the commission's case, this would actually be an advance on 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 a, 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 an important uh, uh, advancement in in in, in Article 102 case law. Whereas uh, the commission side 
uh, things, they are simply applying Article 102 in a plain vanilla manner. I think it's fair to say, at least that's my completely unbiased view, uh, that the truth is certainly somewhere in the middle. I, even, even if I were uh, you know, to reject all of Google's cases, which I, of course I, I, I will not, but that's not the point, I would still think that the theory of favoring in the absence of other pegs and simply based on what could, might very well be a very thorough analysis of effects, uh, uh, particularly going through the uh, click-through flows on the internet, because one of the amazing features of the internet is you can uh, 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 monitor customer behavior you know, in a very, very specific way. You can monitor, you, can ha you have a lot of data, you have a lot of terabytes to look at, and that's something that's typical of digital environments. Uh, as I was saying, we will still have a case where there are no legal pegs. There's uh, discrimination is unclear because it's unclear whether these services are the same or are not. Uh, uh, tying is unclear. Uh, the indispensable, important nature of the input is unclear. Uh, the only thing that may be clear is this theory of favoring, and maybe uh, you know by looking at the data on causation and effect, maybe there is a clear pattern that these conduct are creating a disruptive effect on competition. I'm not saying it isn't, I'm not saying it is, uh, but that's what the court will look at. Uh, but I will still find that to be a, an innovative precedent, uh, as I find the commission's case to be an innovative ca ca precedent, um, in, at least in some of the cases where you know, I'm arguing in court. I don't know if you share that view, uh, uh, Cecilia and Massimiliano. That would be the final effort that I uh, solicit from you, just to tell me uh, what you think of this. Cecilia, please. I, I certainly think that it would be, you know, it's been an interesting precedent, extremely controversial, judging from the you know, debates that has uh, spurred. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing what the court will say. Um, I would have thought maybe if I can just add uh, potentially the last controversial point, perhaps this would have been a case for remedies rather than uh, than a finding of abuse. But again, we will see what the court says. I, I certainly cannot disagree that uh, it's going to be a very interesting uh, judgment uh, from a, a practitioner, but also from an academic point of view. Uh, I. Uh, However, would uh, note that uh, all cases are in a way uh, different. Uh, there is often an element of novelty uh, in each case. Uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, uh, the, the leveraging uh, theory is not novel. Uh, it's something which uh, we have since many, many years and also it has been applied in the, in, in the digital uh, sphere. Uh, there are uh, certainly elements in novelty, of novelty uh, in this case, uh, but not less than in, in other cases. Uh, but nevertheless, of course, uh, it's going to be yeah, interesting to see what uh, the court uh, uh, will have to say uh, on this one. Very well. Then I thank you again on behalf of, the, of Alberto and of the Associazione Antitrust Italiana. I thank you to uh, the listeners and uh, have a very good evening and a good weekend. <laughs> thank you and thank you for the hospitality here at uh, your offices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.